sorry about that. Oh, oh okay. no, it's all good. It's fucking blazing hot everywhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Hell yeah, dude. Glad to be back. Yeah. We met the other day at First Fridays. Yep. Yeah, awesome. But yeah, no, we usually, um, I don't know, I guess to start off, we usually pick our guests just based on not necessarily the quality of the art, though this is really amazing, but mostly just the quality of people's stories and just people that are just interesting and just have, a, I guess, a unique perspective. So I guess, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, would you be down to talk about, like, maybe the origins your creativity yeah I like mean, where you think some of this stuff comes from yeah totally well first of all thank you guys for making the time like oh yeah it's, it's of really course yeah, to sit absolutely. down and talk about this stuff and this is actually one of my first interviews awesome um, so it's fun we're honored yeah <laughs> uh, well I mean the origins it's kind of you know it's kind of difficult because um yeah I only started painting uh, at the beginning of the pandemic but before that I was exploring creativity through like music production mm. um, through dance I danced throughout college on oh, the dance wow. scene um, and then through like graphic design uh, with like businesses and stuff because I, I have a marketing background and yeah um, so I pretty much come from the business world um, mainly doing like video and graphic design right nice. so I feel like my creativity has always kind of manifested in some way um, but it didn't really start uh, with painting until the beginning of the pandemic and I think that painting is for sure um, the avenue of creativity that best suits my brain and my process. How did you choose painting? Like, Was it part of being in lockdown or like? Yeah it was um, you know it's it, I always try to like put myself back in in, um, in my like shoes I guess you could say back then. I know it feels so long ago now. Yeah yeah but um <laughs> There was a, a moment back February before um, the pandemic that um, that I had just been uh, let go from my job because um, they were moving headquarters to Shenzhen in China. Oh, shit. Um, I was the marketing director for this company called Temi, which uh, built the world's first personal assistant robotics platform. Wow. Um, and when they moved headquarters to Shenzhen in February, um, my goal was to like just become an independent robotics distributor um, and I had a day where I just did nothing but paint uh, paint by numbers that my mom had gotten me um, and I just spent like 12 hours working on this paint by numbers of this Buddha um, and then when I had finished it I like put it up to a lamp and I could see um, like all the brush strokes uh, poking through I think it was like an interesting dichotomy when you look at within the context of paint by numbers, right? Paint by numbers is something that's super um, kind of repeatable and you can't really see the individual personality of, of the person painting it. Um, but then I was able to see my brush strokes and in that moment I kind of had like a realization like, oh, oh wow, I need to hone in on, you know, what makes me me. Um, yeah. Those individual brush strokes, that's what makes me me. Um, and it was like very metaphorical. Um, but really it's been nonstop since then. Um, but as soon as I knew I was gonna be isolated in place um, for more than, I, I, did, like I could tell it was gonna be months. Mm. Um, I, for some reason I felt compelled to start painting and I went to the art store there. Um, I was in uh, Burbank, California at the time. Um, I spent like pretty much my last my last dollars on just art supplies and built a little uh, paint studio in my mom's garage. That's great. I really love the um, the paint by numbers metaphor too because mm -hmm. it sounds like to me that you've been a creative individual for a really long time and that's prob that probably is what got you working with this robotics company and like build your, mm -hmm. your career but in a sense you were a creative force within a vessel. Like, you know, within, you know, the, the, I guess, wall. I don't know how much, like, limits you would see in marketing or not. But, like, you know, you're kind of within something. But now it's because this is, I guess, for the viewer, the people that can't see it, this is, like, incredibly, uh, like, high volume, abstract, very high contrast, abstract art. Which is, like, not something that's, like, in a box mm -hmm. or in lines. Also, like, really large scale, like, mm -hmm. I guess, in, in terms of canvas painting goes so I could I definitely could really appreciate how 
Because I think that's like something that like I, I think we've talked about a lot where I don't know how much skill there is with artists innately. Like I don't know if people, I don't know if I believe that people are just born fantastic artists, but I think people are born with like really strong creative drives. You know what I mean? Like I used to like play in the fucking mud Mm-hmm. Or like collar on walls and like break shit when I was a little kid, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So like I don't know, maybe that was like some kind of artistry. I think everything pulling is, through. <laughs> you know, I think everyone is an artist. Yeah. Um, I think any output is creative, um, whether or not it connects with someone else in an influential way is another story. But you know, some people's medium is paint, some people's medium is dance, some people's medium is Microsoft Excel, and people are nice at that. You know. Right. And at the end of the day, it's just a matter of, um, one, it's output, but I think it's also just um, offering perspective. Hmm. And it's that perspective that, in the context of a artist who uses Microsoft Excel as their medium, they offer their perspective through what they do on Excel, and then it can influence change within their organization, which then, in their community, um, in the same way that um, a great musician can influence change through their voice or through their guitar or paintbrush. Yeah, because yeah. it really is a modality of amplifying a voice when you're talking about perspective. Like you're using it as a communication tool, and I think that's where the skill set comes in. Like you can be more or less articulate and better or worse at your own specific kind of communication, but that message is there to begin with. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I feel like that skill set that you're touching on is is the marketing side of it. You know, it's how do you how do you get it in front of as many people as possible in order to impact um, as widespread influences as possible, if that's what you're looking for. You know, I have every respect for someone who just wants to paint um, alone and not show anyone ever, just as a means of their expression and um, them feeling good about themselves. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's all about just honing in on the most authentic output as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you feel with a marketing background that, like, talking about, oh, yeah, go ahead, talking about uh, different people's forms of expression in terms of everything from dance to Microsoft Excel, do you feel like your marketing background, and uh, I guess, influences, kind of, I mean, it obviously influences the way you promote your art, probably, because you have a skill set. But do you feel like it informs like the way that you're making it or thinking about it while it's being created? Like, um, yeah, I mean, and it's it's definitely a fine line, and I try my best to um, to not change my style and my output in order to fit the mold of what the market wants. Right. And, like I actively try not to fit that mold, um, but I think it's impossible to 100 percent not fit that mold you know like it's still happening yeah. subconsciously um, and sometimes I'm aware of it sometimes I'm not um, but you know if I wasn't painting with the idea of selling it in mind all of these like literally everything in this room would be covered with art you know that light bulb yeah like that the, the I floor de- I definitely relate you know? to that because a lot of people we've talked a ton about this on the podcast too the idea of product making versus mm-hmm. the idea of making art yeah. And like making a, like, and, and it's this, your art definitely exists at an intersection of that. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it is true that that's kind of an interesting question I think to ask too is that like a lot of people have to be taught when they're, when they're art students or young artists how to do that, like how to make a product or how yeah. to learn presentation. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like that was something you just kind of figured out on the fly? Um, well, on the, on the topic of art students having to learn that. Um, my partner, my girlfriend, she's, uh, um, she's down the hall. She's an artist as well, and she went to art school. Mm-hmm. And there's things that we'll talk about um, regarding marketing artwork, regarding selling artwork, getting into shows, uh, negotiating with galleries and collectors and dealers that she just wasn't taught in school, and they mm-hmm. don't teach that in school, mm-hmm. which I think is, is absurd, you know? Um, because in order to continue to make art, you need to fund it. Yeah. Um, and it's not cheap. Like materials are expensive. Canvas is expensive. Um, so I, I absolutely think that that kind of education should be taking place. Um, was it for me? Um, was it something that I innately had? Absolutely not. Like you said, I I agree that we aren't necessarily born with 
um, information, but more so born with a capacity to accrue information. Um, that capacity exists on a spectrum, and I think everyone has a different capacity, and then you can alter that throughout time through further education and experience. Um, but I, I didn't study marketing in school. Um, I studied psychology at Boston College, and um, it wasn't until um, the summer after I had graduated that I started learning marketing, um, because I had started a company with some friends, and I was in charge of marketing, and I basically, for that whole summer after graduation, I was in Barnes and Noble from opening to, uh, from opening to closing, just um, like going book by book down uh, the marketing aisle, yeah. um, just trying to learn as much as possible. Um, and then it was just like the experience of contextualizing that within the product that we were selling, which was an application at the time, um, and then in the context of the robotics company spreading a robot around the world. So I guess too, with, this, with the start of this company, um, how, how did you land on your role in marketing, were you just like, fuck it, I'm in, I'll, I'll try it? Like, or was it? No, it was, um, so I initially wanted to do psychology research, um, and I was brought on to the sociology team of Tinder uh, to do that, huh. um, oh, wow. to do sociology research and see how people use Tinder throughout the world differently, um, which, whatever you think about the app, that's a side, but I think that it's fascinating to try and understand, like, how people use the app, because it's a direct a reflection on how people feel about others and themselves in different areas of the world. Um, so like we would be seeing how people use it in India versus China or versus like Japan and so on and so on. Um, but then I would say things like, oh, it's interesting that people are using the app in India in this way. It'd be cool if we could do like a commercial um, in India that would show this, this and this. And then my manager at the time said, oh, you should go talk to the marketing team. And I was like, oh, what's marketing? <laughs> um, so then I was slowly introduced into marketing through, um, through the folks there at Tinder. And I'm still good friends with them. And I really, um, you know, I think that they're incredible marketers and people. And they've taught me a lot. That's awesome. To teach me, yeah. That sounds like a really interesting opportunity, especially with the psychology background. Because mm -hmm. um, I feel like that can, I also studied psychology in school, so cool. I think it's really interesting the ways that that feeds almost every profession, because mm -hmm. at the root of everything, any human output is processed by the brain. So, Absolutely. I don't know, those patterns are fun to be able to detect, and I feel like they can give you a lot of insight to how people are even responding to your work, or mm -hmm. what maybe they're looking for, which is marketing when you think about it in the sales point of view. Yeah, but you know, I feel like with the, with that psychology background, I'm never thinking, oh, hmm, like, how should I build out this composition? How should I choose these colors uh, to best influence psychology in this way? No, it's, if anything, it's, it's the opposite. It's me turning inward and mm -hmm. trying to break down the barriers and the walls that are um, getting in the way of raw authenticity and raw yeah. um, output. Because um, that is the most interesting thing. Like, I found with um, a lot of, like, I, I like write music and, and I'm obviously like a, I guess like a fanatic and I, I fucking love all, all different types of music but one thing I've always noticed about lyrics in lyric writing is that the most unrelatable like cold clinical lyrics were super general and like all encompassing but the ones that were like ultra relatable that like hit, hit you in your core were very specific about the people's lives like to the point of using characters names that you've never met but you like kind of relate to them in a way and I kind of feel like that's really true with art because like you probably have favorite artists or shit that you're interested in and you could probably tell as a consumer yourself when you're when somebody's selling to you mm -hmm. or when you're trying to be influenced in a way mm -hmm. so I think that like in terms of like authenticity being such like a focus for you like I think it definitely shows because it's it's like I don't know it's kind of like as an adult you can kind of tell if someone's lying to your face <laughs> like you can just can kind of get the feeling but I don't know. I think authenticity kind of has a way of showing itself without, um, well, maybe it's the other way around. Like, I feel like bullshit is so much easier to notice. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? In terms of, I don't even know what I'm saying. I think oh, I started off as a fucking, <laughs> as a question. But like, <laughs> well, I, I think that's where the, like, art versus product debate or question kind of comes in. Because it's like, if you, and not that I really think there's anything wrong with somebody making something to sell it and pay the bills and better their life. Like, that's totally fine. I've done that. I think everybody's done that at some point. But the work that 
is kind of inner work put onto a canvas or like kind of exploring themes that only maybe you relate to at first, I think that comes across to the viewer too. It has its own, even monetary value after the fact, but you can see that progression in the series of work versus each individual piece being like, this is a portrait that I made of a model that I'm gonna sell or mm -hmm. whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Because it kind of, it, it also asks the question, can, can like, I mean, I kind of think it can, a product totally can be art. You know what I mean? And there's, I think, a lot of ev evidence and precedent in art history of people uh, express expressing things like art, uh, making fine art, kind of in a manufactured, product-focused way. Mm -hmm. You know, everything from the modernism, Mandy Warhol shit, to pop art of, of right now. Well, I think the thing about that, though, is like, um, that in itself was an exploration of the concept of a product. Like, that right. was still working through an idea, that was still a genuine expression. Mm -hmm. I think if you're somebody 20 years later who's making the exact same kind of art just because you know someone will buy it, it's more, that really is the authenticity. Like, the mm -hmm. individual art object, looking at it with no background or context or understanding of who the artist is, maybe it would look the same. But if you look at their work and you look at, like, not their thesis, I guess, but just the things that they're working through, you can see that in someone's portfolio if they are really reflecting on something or really have that authenticity to it. I don't know. This isn't even a question. We're just talking now. No, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I agree that I think you can tell when something wasn't created um, in a raw and authentic um, stream of consciousness state. Um, I, I also, I don't know, I struggle to see the difference between product and art. Um, I see everything that humans make as tools. Mm -hmm. um, huh. And, like, like that painting on a canvas is a, a tool for expression, um, a tool for influencing perspective, and, and um, it came from um, an output of perspective, you know? Um, and I think it's, you know, it's okay to, to create something to sell it, you know? Yeah. Because I think it's the selling that almost validates it, um, in a way, validates it to, in the context within a market. Um, you know, I'm not the artist who only thinks about creating art. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about creating art and um, influencing widespread change. And, yeah. you know, say what you will about uh, currency and business, but it's important to align it with, um, with the, the market and align it. Uh, it, it you know, it, the art itself is really a currency in its own um, regard. It's true. But it also holds ideas where, like, raw, like, the U.S. dollar doesn't necessarily hold ideas in itself. So it's interesting, um, the fact that, I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to get at, but basically the fact that, like, this piece of art is worth X now, and at one point later in time it will be worth um, X plus whatever. Um, but all throughout that, it's telling a story that's removed from the the consensus value of it. And the value that the buyer puts onto it and the mm -hmm. worth that it has to that person mm -hmm. almost increases, or it does increase the value. Mm -hmm. Because somebody, in order to create more at a higher price, somebody has to purchase it again. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And it's also true, too. I think you've said this to me before, but I think about this all the time. Just, like, to have, for a body of work to have a lasting impact or for an artist to have a lasting impact, that work has to be disseminated. Because if you just keep all of it, yeah. I think about that, yeah, all the time. All of the art that I've had for more than a few years that I made has, like, a fucking hole punctured into it where it was, like, crushed under a pile of shit. And the work that exists of mine that is in the world, the, like, the best preserved art that I have made, somebody else owns it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because, like, I've always, that's what I've always found. Because I, like, you, I, I bet you have the same problem, but, like, I, I manufacture art faster than I can sell it. You know what I mean? A lot of the times, which means storage, you know what I mean? And like, I always, yeah, like a belief that I have is that the best way to preserve your work and the best way to, you know, make it survive is to give it to somebody that loves it. You know what I mean? Because a lot of the time for me, I see like, I don't know, like I, I like paint right over shit that I made a few years ago all the time. Really? You know, I kind of see that you kind of did that as well with some of these. Oh, yeah. Kind of re reinvent of these, the aesthetics. <laughs> most of these have like yeah. four or five underneath. You really? Know? Wow. And... You know, like, people, like, will come in here and, um, 
you know, I've had other artists say like, wow, man, you got to start selling. You have a big inventory. And I was <laughs> like, you have no idea how much I actually make. Because yeah. this right. is like 10% of it. The rest is gone. And, and yesterday, actually, um, it's crazy, like, coming up on, like, a full year of, like, really doing this. Um, yesterday, I was, I spent all day working on, um, like, a, a book. Like, I'm working on this book um, that I'll be releasing soon of just, um, the like, the big pieces that, that I think are important over, like, since I started. Um, That's exciting. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Uh, and there's, like, something like 100 pieces in there. Um, and just, like, seeing them all and, like, seeing, like, how they've changed over time in, in concept, in composition, in color choice. Um, and then thinking, like, wow, most of these are, like, up in people's homes. And it's just crazy. Even the self-portraits are just, like, up in people's homes. And my <laughs> face is just, like, on people's walls. It's so weird. But, That's awesome. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that. One thing that I think is an interesting question, I think it's kind of a shitty question, but I think that it's like also almost a little bit important for context too, because we, so we know that a lot of our listeners are definitely not, um, like they're, you know, I'm sure we, there's like great artists that like whatever, but like not, uh, like, I think it's interesting to know not like invalidating you at all like i think this art is like fucking awesome and it's like really awesome what you're doing here and i think but this is such like a this space has such a great reputation like this buildings we're in soa or i guess i don't know what you would yeah. call it but like i think it's interesting too to consider artists that follow us that are that are beginning or that you know people that are even still in school and shit and I think it's interesting because there are definitely people that would ask in this moment, like, how did you get here? Mm -hmm. Or like, how did this happen? Or like, what do I have to do to mm -hmm. get to this place? You know what I mean? Which I guess are interesting questions, but like, I just think it's interesting to note that like, I don't know. I, I guess I don't even know what I'm asking, but like, you're painting for a year through the pandemic and making like a huge body of work in a fucking really amazing and interesting art landscape in Boston. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess, like, I'm kind of wondering, did you know about SOA? Like, did you ever hang out here before? Uh, <laughs> like, so I was in LA painting for most of quarantine. Um, oh, where? I relocated to Boston in July. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I found out about SOA for the first time ever in September. Wow. I came here on a Saturday, um, and I was walking around, and there was only one artist who had their studio open here, and it was Tom Stalker. Uh, over on the second floor and I spoke to him and he told me about his artwork and he showed me his studio um, and then I came back the next day um, and basically just talked to as many people as I could how do I get in this building, how do I get in this building how do I get in this building um, to literally everyone and they basically said oh talk to this guy, talk to this person there's a three year wait list, talk to this person, talk to this person and, you know, at the end of the day of doing this for, like, four or five hours, I had, like, seven people who said to talk to this person, six people who said to talk to this other person, yeah. and five people who told me it'd be impossible to get in here. Um, it's not too hot? It's too hot. Why you don't tell about this if not working? <laughs> I just got here. But we're, we're in an interview right now. Uh, Excuse me? I'm in an interview right now. So, so yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for those listening, it's very warm in this room. <laughs> yeah, door's open. But, um, but uh, yeah, so after figuring out who to talk to and, and that it could be possible, um, then I DM'd every artist in the building, and eventually um, I met Katie, Katie Southworth, who um, is my girlfriend now. We've been dating since. Um, but I told her my story, and she felt compelled to share my story with the person who was um, looking for a sublease for this room, oh, wow. um, and I was able to bypass the, the three-year wait list and got in. That's I'm very awesome for it. That's you amazing. Know, but That's in terms sick. of like how I got here, like you know, if you, I think if you were to just boil it down to like a couple of sentences, it's just really like you know, I think that there's so many people out there who are trying to be something. Um, because it's what people to the left and right of them tell them that they have to be. 
mm. as opposed to turning inward and trying to be as much them as they could be, you know? Like, I, it was never my goal to have a studio. It was never my goal to paint. It was just, I just want to be as much me as I can be because, yeah. you know, I believe in what I have to share with the world and I believe that my time is limited um, mm. and, I'm, and I want to... That's, I think, to go back to the question of why I started painting, for me, it really, like, it came from this, this fear of death from the pandemic. Mm. Um, mm. And, and um, <laughs> but it was delusional. I knew it was delusional, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it was productive, so I, like, leaned into it a little bit, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know. So, uh, so it's, like, for me, it's, it was, like, okay, I have these ideas. I have this perspective that I want to exist beyond me. Um, I thought that the best way to do that would be to get on something physical like a canvas. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'll never forget the first time um, I went to Blick here in Boston and I was asking for like different materials to paint on and I asked the person working there, I was like, so how long would this last? Like four or five hundred years? And she looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? But that's like, that's what I'm trying to do, you know, is to have a multi hundred year career. And, yeah. And, you know, I think we all want to live forever in a way. Absolutely. And I, I think, too, one thing that I, I'd love to point out, too, like, is that one theme I'm hearing through everything you're talking about from the marketing with your with, with the robotics company and, like, working for Tinder and then, like, all of these, the art that you're making, like, even talking about when you started learning about marketing, mm -hmm. saying, like, you know, being at Barnes & Noble's for a day, just, like, going through as many books as you possibly can even coming here and like talking to people messaging people mm -hmm. and like, like it sounds like like really fucking hard work i was just gonna say that yeah. like it just sounds like work you know what i mean because it's really easy to look at people who i don't know who are making a lot of art or whatever and to think and like it almost looks magical mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. but like I, yeah, it's more than cigarettes and berets i'll tell you that much yeah <laughs> right <laughs> Um, yeah, totally. So it's really, it's really cool to just see an example of that, you know what I mean? To see like, you know, cause like I can see this isn't just like splashes of color either. Like these are really well painted canvases, like yeah. with a lot of material on them, you know what I mean? And they look like, you know, I, I have no idea how much time you spend on your work, but they're, they're like very clearly worked pieces, <laughs> yeah. you know? And another thing, too, that I, like, I noticed there's books here, like, you're doing your research, there are artists whose work relates to your work, like, it, this isn't just, like, a whim kind of thing, and when you're talking about, like, the marketing research and, like, robotics and all the different things that you've done, it seems like, even if it was something that was, like, you're a very well-rounded person, but it seems like you're putting a lot of intention and commitment into the projects that you're doing, and I think that's very important to note, because it's not, like you're saying, it's not just cigarettes and berets, like, there's a lot of actual, like, hands-on work that goes into it beyond the actual artwork I think you know if it's hard work if if my like main focus if my like the main way I spent my time was you know having fun and, and going out and, and playing and, and uh, chilling with friends and then going to paint yeah like then it would be hard work because it was like and it was relative to the not working but and this is like, I'm not, I don't recommend this on anyone, uh, <laughs> but you know, I only work. Yeah. I only work. Um, like, all day long I'm either, um, and, but the thing is I'm not always painting. I probably spend like 10% of my time painting. The rest is, is um, like DMing people on Instagram all day long, talking to collectors, talking to dealers, talking to galleries, um, knocking on doors. I did this mural across the street just by going into the warehouse, like, almost every day for months, just like, can I speak to the owner, can I speak to the owner? Um, reading artists, like art books, just being super methodical about my input. Yeah. Um, and it, it's constant and, you know, I really, like I said, I think for me, um, something I think about a lot is time um, and how limited my time here is. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to make the most of it and I know that at the, at the upper level, like or at the, upper limit of that, um, that means I'm working all the time, um, which is a painful existence, truly, and those around me um, often, like, you know, there's sacrifices, and, and I think it harms those around me at times, but they're very understanding, and, 
and I do my best to be as balanced as possible, and those around me definitely um, help out with that and support that. Yeah. Well, it's a hard thing, because if you, even if you have, like, all the passion in the world, if you're not putting that time into your work, it shows. Like, you can see the people that are really putting their all into it and really want this more than other people, you know? Or maybe not even want it, but are willing to put the work forward. So I think those people are the ones that end up getting opportunities. Because if you're there asking for them all the time, who's going to tell you no at the end of the day, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah, I mean, my dad, growing up, he would always tell me, like, the worst thing that they say is no. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, I think there is a distinction to be made between passion and obsession. Mm. Um, This is an obsession of mine. Um, And I tell people this, and I feel like a lot of people, they, they don't really get it, but if I was trying to paint, if I was trying to be an artist, it wouldn't, like, it wouldn't even be, like, 10% of this. Um, it's, you know, this is just, like, I don't feel, um, it's interesting, I feel like, and I've heard other artists say things like this, and it, I really connect with it, but I feel like a vessel almost for, like, creation of these ideas and the spread of these ideas um you know it's an obsession I feel like it's since it's like come into my world it hasn't left um and the rest of me like the ego um Joe Tavares is like trying to shape things in my own world to allow for this obsession to um to not destroy me so I quit my job in February. Um, that part of getting the studio was like my ego being like, okay, what do we need to do in order to sustain this, to sustain the vessel as, as long as possible? Yeah. yeah. And what brought you to Boston again? I was relocated um, for oh. work. Oh, right, 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 gotcha. So last year, um, I got an opportunity to be um, like the main distributor for um, the robot in senior living communities and hospitals. So I was spreading it around different senior living communities and hospitals. Um, and that started in May, and then they relocated me here in July. Um, all throughout quarantine, by the way, I was paying <laughs> rent in an apartment in Bushwick, which is really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I never got to say goodbye to New York, which is too bad. Um, oh, man. But, but yeah, then um, relocated here in July, and it's been a lot of fun since. Yeah. So almost a year that you've been in Boston then. Yeah, and it's crazy because um, Katie and I were actually going to Los Angeles um, in a couple of weeks. And, you know, that's where I started painting. And I really feel like it's going to be a graduation in a way. Yeah. Um, to return back to the place where I started and um, in a place that I called home for uh, many years as well. Did you did you say you're leaving You're leaving the city? No. no. Or a trip, got yeah, it. Yeah, just, okay. just a little vacation. That'll yeah. be awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is your painting set up still... In the, in the garage there? No. No, they got sold, cleaned up. My mom sold the house. Oh, so damn. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's unfortunate because, like, you know, how you can, like, drive by and, like, see the old backyard sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, there's a huge wall. And I oh, man. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, no, I mean, still just be able to, like, go through the streets. And I'm, I'm always, like, I like to think about, like, the passage of time. And, um, and it's always cool to, like, you know, think about what this room was like a year ago, what this room like was 50 years ago, um, what this room was like a thousand years ago. And, yeah. You know, I'll be back in LA and be like, damn, a year ago I was here walking my dog and thinking it's, about starting a pin. It's a cool thing too, because like I'm, I'm 25, Theo is 23, you're 24. This building has existed probably fucking 150 years longer <laughs> than us. There was probably an artist in this room, I don't know if this was an artist building 25 years ago, but like there could have been other artists sitting here like we were before we were born. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that's fucked. <laughs> like you know, yeah. it's an interesting thing. Like I think about that a lot with like lineage, mm-hmm. with like art, art shit. You know what I mean? Like we've talked about a lot about like mentorship and you know uh, information and and tradition being passed down from artist to artist. That's something I wanted to ask you too. Do you have you had any artistic mentors in in your career and creativity so far? Um. In, in terms of like the actual aesthetics of it I mean I guess anything I mean even with the theory or aesthetics or the way you see it um, 
I mean, well, yeah, for sure. You know, the answer is definitely yes. Um, I'm just trying to think about how it's like changed over time. Uh, at the beginning, um, I didn't have really any living mentors, um, but also no one really knew I was painting. I was kind of doing it in, yeah. in Low key. isolation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I even made like my Instagram at that time was anonymous. And, mm. um, but my mentors at that time were Warhol, were Basquiat, were Picasso, and I would just watch YouTube videos of them, yeah. um, both of their artwork, but also of them. And I, you know, I've done this in the past. Um, people think I'm a little weird for doing this, and I know I am, but, you know, it's part of my process, but I'll just, like, study people. Um, like, in the past, I've studied uh, Kobe Bryant, Steve Jobs, mm. um, Bezos, and Picasso, and Basquiat, and just, like, watch them, just trying to get into their brain and, like, try to activate my mirror neurons as much as possible, you know, to be able to see through their lens mm. yeah. um, as much as I could as an outside uh, viewer. Um, so at the time, I was just watching their videos and, like, studying their work, and um, and that was that. Um, but then over time, I started to like meet more people. Once I left LA and came here, I started to meet more people. And my mentors, for sure, are my girlfriend, Katie, um, because she is trained, because she's been painting uh, longer than I have. Um, she's, you know, she's been super helpful in, um, in like, nudging me. It's also, because she's an a elementary school art teacher. Oh. Uh, so she's been helpful in, like, nudging me in, in good directions and away from... Um, directions that might not be good um, not from an aesthetics perspective and I give her a lot of credit for that because like huh. sometimes I'll create some art and it's it's crazy and it's you know dark sometimes and looks wild and she'll just come in here and straight face and be like interesting you know never judging <laughs> yeah. never saying oh this doesn't look this and, uh, like never trying to push me in one direction or the other but just like validating its existence for what it is yeah. um, but she's been super helpful in um, the more like technical like conserv- conservation and, and just like the, you know, allowing my art to be safe. Yeah. Um, but then other mentors like my art dealers and, and collectors, um, and even like some local gallerists who have, uh, their, the mentorship has grown. Um, and they'll, they'll come in on an open studio and like talk to me for hours and just like see how I'm doing. Um, yeah. Connect me with different people and whatnot. Interesting. So how did you get into the, aside from SOA, like the gallery part of it, did that come with having a studio here? Or did you do more like outreach to different galleries in Boston? Um, It's interesting, like, and I joke about this all the time with Katie, but like, since I started painting full time a couple of months ago, I feel like this like mile and a half radius of artists and galleries is like a big office space and we're all just co-workers in a way yeah um like i'll just walk down the street and like see a gallery owner and be like oh hey how you doing nice <laughs> to see you how's everything how's the show going um because I'm, I'm like i try to go into these galleries at least once a week yeah um and just talk to them and not for any it's not for any like intention or like ulterior motive it's just mm. you know just to discuss art and yeah. culture and connect with them um, and so it's just, it wasn't like I like made a strategic outreach to these galleries um, and I'm definitely not represented and I don't think that that will happen anytime soon yeah um, especially within Boston um, but it it was just like me walking in there and talking to them and, that makes sense yeah. it's funny because I feel like place like SOA, a lot of the reputation that I feel like it has among like art students or other people in Boston is that it's a very like high level, um, like, I don't know what adjectives I'm looking for, but like for me, I come from like a DIY art background. Like I've been doing it for a really long time, but didn't really know a lot about selling until the last couple of years um, on like a real legitimate level. So something like this feels so out of reach, but I feel like what you're talking about are the same kind of principles of like kind of fostering and being engaged with your community and kind of treating it like a scene or like mm-hmm. people that are making that you have that authentic relationship with and mm-hmm. people recognize that authenticity and that drive in other people. Mm-hmm. That's very encouraging, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to like talk about the work with people, you know, just like yeah. to, ha- to open the studio to the public, and especially because my work is all created in a state of stream of consciousness. There's mm-hmm. times when I won't see things in it yeah. and someone will walk in and be like, oh, this looks like this or like, oh, is that a face there? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is. Um, and then I learn more about it. And, um, 
there's other times when I'll make something on a Saturday and it'll sell on Sunday morning and I'll never get to really um, learn from it. Yeah. For value to photograph it and everything. Well, I, I photograph <laughs> everything. You know, I document it. Right, got it. Um, <laughs> which is important. Um, especially now that I'm, like, creating this book. You know, it's yeah. nice to be able to have all these photographs and stuff. But, you know, there's, there's some pieces that I photograph, but uh, I don't write down the names. Oh. And, you know, it's something you take for granted because, like, here, like, I know all the names of these pieces because I can just look on the back of the canvas. Yeah. But if it's up on someone's wall in right. like, guitar. You know. in, their, in their house or yeah. something, yeah. yeah. How important are titles to you of the paintings? And, like, is it more it's, just... I have a weird relationship with titles. Really? <laughs> yeah, because it's, like, you know, it's, like, subconscious versus the conscious mind. Just, yeah. Mm, yeah. It's, like, me, like... My ego be like, hmm, what does this look like? As opposed to like my subconscious is like, don't, how can, don't you, do that. <laughs> how can you put it like, I don't know. That's like productizing. Sure. In, in a way, which. Interesting. Like sometimes the title is just like obvious, you know. Um, like this piece, for instance. The, uh, uh, well, the circle on the left. Yeah, this one right here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That piece is titled 4040 Vision. Um, and there's a painting that's underneath it, uh, titled 2020 Vision. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I covered it and, and retitled it. Uh, and that just made sense. Um, and then, I don't know, but there's other times when I just, it doesn't come to me. Just, I'll just keep thinking it doesn't come to me, and then that's untitled. Mm. Yeah. Which is a title in itself. It's bullshit. Right. You know? <laughs> That's an interesting perspective. I've always had a really hard time naming my pieces. Most of them Same. are just untitled. And then I go to number them and I forget what I numbered the last one. Yeah. Just, like, right. <laughs> cataloging is so fucking difficult. Yeah. You know, when you're making so much shit, mm -hmm. especially on paper. And like for me, mm -hmm. I like have these big envelopes that I just keep shit in mm -hmm. and like just like archive them. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know what the fuck I got in those things. <laughs> Yeah, but those are the types of things that you won't find for years, and when you do find them, yeah. you'll be like, oh, wow, I'm doing that now. Yeah, you know? yeah, hmm. gifts to your future self. Exactly. <laughs> I like to call it marinating. Yeah. Uh, I do that with clothes a lot. Oh, I'll, really? I'll, like, hide my clothing, <laughs> and then, like, I'll refine it, like, years later, and be like, ah, oh, it's been marinating, and now I want to wear it twice yeah. as much. Yeah. <laughs> so how does it feel to be making a retrospective book, especially when you started painting in a time that was as, like, emotionally visceral as mm -hmm. quarantine, lockdown? Mm -hmm. Like, is it strange or like do you see the ways that you've grown in the beginning or from the beginning? Um, I think part of my productivity process has always just been putting the metaphorical blinders up and just running as fast as I can and not really looking to the left and right of me and just you know, trying to be authentic and getting as far as possible in that authenticity. Um, and, you know, yesterday when I was really piecing together this book and just looking at like hundreds of my pieces and, and I was using this program called Sketch uh, where you can like zoom out and like see everything all together and just like seeing everything all together was definitely a slap in the face. Um, <laughs> just being like, hey, Joe, wake up, look at what you did. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and it's like, oh shit, like <laughs> this is my life now. Uh, but it's crazy. Uh, it's super wild and um, yeah, like, aside from just being able to, like, see the progression, um, it's, it's just crazy. You know, I'm still trying to make sense of it all. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really exciting thing, because, like, I mean, you know, you meet people in random professions, and they're like, yeah, I had fucking no idea mm -hmm. I was going to do this yeah. a few years ago. But it's kind of like, you're, you, like, did you, I guess I'm kind of wondering, did you, at, like, you know, was there no, like, uh, like when you were younger or something, did you like ever be like, damn, it'd be fucking sick to just be an artist in a fucking bit studio in a random city, fucking I mean, churning out paintings and selling them and making a fucking book? <laughs> uh, I mean, I never like titled it like, oh, I want to be an artist. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, I did have, um, I don't know. I, b I believe that you can predict the future. If you really pay attention to your own patterns, mm. um, to what you're thinking about, to try and understand why you're thinking about it, you can predict your own future in a lot of ways um, because tomorrow is connected to today. Um, and growing up, I did have like, like ideas of 
um, you know, having influence, um, living a, um, I don't know, just a, a different lifestyle, being able to travel a lot, you know, that's, that's one thing I miss. Um, before the pandemic, I was on a plane like twice a week with the robot, wow. um, taking it to places like Tokyo and Australia and, and just getting that huge influx of culture. And, um, you know, I've always, I always envisioned that growing up. Um, I didn't even know something like this is possible, like, like being an artist. Yeah. Um, but now that I'm doing it, I'm like, well, this is the only thing I can do, you know, because <laughs> I've always been an artist. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, the one thing that I have to like continuous re- continuously remind myself is that um, you know it's where I, I feel like I'm always going to be creating something. Today it's paintings. Yeah. Yesterday it was robot applications. The day before it was music right um tomorrow i'll be painting but maybe i'll also be making clothing maybe i'll also be creating technology you know when i think about the future i'm not going to be in this room i'm not Mm going to be sitting in front of the easel i I see myself in a in a small factory um that i built like creating um like basically i want to get to a point where I can just like sit down with a team of just like brilliant creatives and uh, uh, Kobe would call them obsessives, like people who are obsessed with, with their craft. Just sitting down with this team and be like, all right, what's wrong right now in this city? What's wrong in this country? How can we put our minds together to solve it? And it doesn't need to be a direct solution, but even if it's like, like in the context of painting, even if it's a painting that changes the way people feel about something that's enough because then it can get the ball rolling yeah. because I believe that the dialogue that we create today builds the reality of tomorrow um, and that's really all I'm trying to do with my art is, is impact positive change by, by just inspiring new dialogue by talking about different things you know like people say my artwork is dark well, I think I was telling you this the other day. Well, yeah, it's dark. Have you looked around what's happening in the world? Like, I'm not going to be painting, like, sunshine and, like, happy stuff. Right. I'm, I'm just expressing authentically, and this is how I view the world. Um, but if you do look closely at the pieces, you'll see something beautiful. You'll see a story that is deep within all of us um, that we can all relate to. But, yeah, there's the darkness, there's the fear, there's the mystery, but there's also the love and the happiness. And I just, that's... I think life is all of that put together and I think it'd be ridiculous to not at least acknowledge the darkness yeah especially in a time like now or last year and now um there's a lot of it honestly that I think a lot of us were trying to kind of run from so it's interesting Mm -hmm. that you kind of leaned into that Mm -hmm. at that time yeah one artist who I I have a tremendous amount of respect for and a lot of people are not a fan of his work is Francis Bacon Mm -hmm. and I feel like he leaned into the darker sides of of his uh, psyche yeah. a lot with his artwork and um, you know I feel like that's in the past and present it's angered people mm. but that's fine it, you know I, I don't want like I expect my work to not connect with everyone but if it angers some people it's still impacting change and that's all that matters yeah any response or emotional response is a response that's, yeah. <laughs> there's still a dialogue there mm-hmm. yeah and in terms of dialogue too I mean we like one of the reasons why I thought we should interview you is because like we are really interested in finding kind of threads and dialogues mm-hmm. that are harder to notice because one thing I noticed about about you immediately and with this conversation is you're very different than all of our guests so far mm-hmm. and one thing one another reason why we really wanted to interview you too is because uh, we like even we relate to you on art and, and and love what you do but our backgrounds are so different and all the people we've interviewed so far share a place with yeah. us they're like our friends or people that we know cool. or people that we're like mm-hmm. you know what i mean but like it's really cool to connect with like because your story is pretty foreign to us and to you know or i guess like i guess i'll speak for myself i sound like we're like a fucking <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> like a you know, organism you know i feel like uh 
people are always wanting to travel to some faraway place, but they haven't really traveled into the minds of the person walking on the street. You know, there's, yeah, if true. you go from like, like you know how LinkedIn has like first connection, second connection, third connection of like mm-hmm. peripheral people. Yeah. If you go like two people out, like if you ask me, like, oh, introduce me or introduce me to someone, you know, like. I'll introduce you guys to someone and, yeah. and they're going to offer a completely different perspective and you can travel in their minds for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's, you know, I think it's important to just explore other perspectives. I'm really happy to be a part of this. Thank you. Yeah, dude, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to have you because we're just like, like the, I think we, we thought when we started this, because like there's, there's some kind of like hubris and like kind of like ridiculous assumptions by what we're like we're the boston art podcast but like we have like absolutely like no real reason to to, to claim to be that i guess but we're you are like, it. You, you are know it. what i mean well yeah so like it's just like our thesis in the beginning was just to like oh let's just interview artists wouldn't that be cool or like mm-hmm. document conversations but what it's turned into is just like capturing these just such fucking interesting moments because like mm. I don't know man like you said like you're probably not going to be here in the future we might not be either you know what I mean but yeah. like to be able to capture this to me is like you can't put a price on this kind of thing like a, you I know totally agree. I mean like you look at I mean I don't know if you guys have been to the MFA I used yeah. to work there oh, yeah. Word? yeah that's so cool uh so the Basquiat exhibit you know you yeah have, yeah it was really good like people like y'all who are going around with a microphone or camera mm. um, capturing what was happening. You have oh, people like yeah. Mr. Brainwash who right, um, yeah. was going around with a camera capturing that moment in time, that moment in art history. Yeah. Um, because, you know, we, we live in a very interesting time where we're able to, like, see video, capture video, um, record things, um, and that's beyond just the painting on the wall, you know? Hmm. When you think about most of the, like, revolutionary periods in art history and when concepts really kind of snowballed from one artist to many artists, it's because there were things, like, most of the famous artists in art history that existed in different cities knew each other. All of them did, for the most part. Because they were sharing ideas and that is what created that creative output. Mm -hmm. It didn't just happen. Um, And these kinds of things, like artist salons, or people just get meeting up and talking, like that kind of stuff, is where the actual cultural exchange occurs. Because the contextualization by gallerists happens a hundred years after the fact, Mm -hmm. most of the time. Right, and it's because it's interesting because like the Basquiat exhibit is such a good example too, because it's like just all of these like Basquiat didn't put that show together. That isn't a body of work he had in storage. Mm -hmm. It was created by maybe a group of people, like curators and gallerists and whatever. But like just a, one thing that I remember blew my mind from that that fucking um, exhibit where there was like a door or like a window or something they had hanging up oh. that had like a Basquiat drawing on it and a uh, what's his name the fucking guy the Hermosy no it, it Heron oh yeah Heron. yeah it was, was just that, yeah. both of them had tagged us the same surface just in the in the same period of time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. maybe they didn't even know that they did that, the two of them. Yeah, see, that's you know? one thing I'm, like, a little nervous about. It's because I'm very, like, methodical about where I'm putting my ideas on oh, the yeah. canvases. Mm. But, you know, there's, like, I have sticky notes that are just probably in someone's private collection. Yeah, maybe, yeah. About, right, you yeah. know, <laughs> We'll be in the museum one day, maybe, but, you know, there's... And I say I've started painting at the beginning of the pandemic, but, you know, I'm sure I was drawing and hmm. or something before. Like, right. I'm sure there's going to be people who are like, yeah, like Joe gifted me this drawing in, in elementary school and I kept it and I found it in storage. And, like, yeah. <laughs> probably. Yeah. You know. It's a, yeah, it's a, what the fuck was I going to say too? Because that, that's kind of an interesting thing to think too, because there are artists like Basquiat where there are pieces popping up that I've, I've heard his like estate or whatever doesn't even authenticate his paintings anymore mm-hmm. I guess the Too listener many. can fact check me but like but then they're like because there's so fucking many of them but then there's artists like Lucian Freud for example if you're familiar with him where before he died uh, and throughout his career there were paintings that he literally like incinerated mm-hmm. and fucking destroyed because and he didn't do that because he's like oh they sucked or whatever but he did that because he was fucking completely 100% sure what 
which pieces he wanted to survive. Yeah. Oh, he knew think exactly about that. what think he wanted time. Yeah, to keep. Do you feel like you have think about it more like that, where you're more like connected with uh, the body of work? Like, of course. Yeah, like I mean, you have destroy a lot. You know, I hmm. destroy a lot of work. Probably most of my work. You know, um, and it is because I'm like a marketer. Yeah. You know? Um, shaping the narrative um, right which hmm. as an artist you can you can do that because you, at the end of the day like as an artist you're in control of your artistry um, so you know there's you know in the past when I've worked in, in corporations and whatnot um, there's a level of like like you can't do things you can't do this you can't do that um, but as an artist, like, you get to decide like, what you want to be a part of your, your artwork or not. Eat those. Yeah, exactly. And there's pieces in this room that will probably get destroyed at some point, you know? Huh. Or even added to or something. Yeah. 40-40 visioned, yeah. so to speak. 80-80. 80-80, <laughs> yeah, that would actually be sick. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, what a fucking interesting thing. I gotta say, my favorite one that I keep looking at is this yellow and blue one. Yeah. I keep returning to that one over and over again. And the one that seems to be this ball with the... This one? Yeah, it looks almost like it's on a street. Yeah. Or it's like in some type of hallway. But yeah, those two. Yeah, I that one. I look at over and over again. That one's the newest one. Um, <laughs> it's actually kind of inspired by this shirt that oh, yeah. had given me, which I made. She gave me this shirt on... Um, last Monday, and then Monday night, I had a dream about this. And I, in the middle of the night, I sketched it and did it, um, and then this led to that. Um, but uh. in between doing this and that, I was like actively studying uh, Francis Bacon, Mondrian, mm. um, and even uh, some Robert Nava, um, mm. uh, Brooklyn, and just trying to piece together uh, these ideas. And it's a very different. Um, like aesthetically different piece than the others. And I think that, like I'm very grateful for his timing because um, like, especially in the creation of this book that I'm working on, there's such a distinct difference between like everything I have made and this style. That's like, okay, now it's time to retroactively like, like kind of put these into year one. Yeah. You know, and then this is the next chapter. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's exciting to kind of have that delineation at the year mark of, like, this is what I've done and this is the future I'm going towards. Mm -hmm. Like, do you usually think about creative things and phases that way? Or is it kind of more fluid most of the time in the book is just changing your perspective a little bit? Um, well, I definitely think of things in phases, but it's not, like, proactively. It's always retroactively. Yeah. So I'll be like, okay, that's interesting that I did, like, these before um, these, you know, when really what this is is, like, taking the aesthetics of this piece but just like cramming them into a portrait yeah you know it's like all the colors and ideas and symbols are all within this head or those heads um so yeah i mean the the and they're just going back to patterns like it's just me retroactively trying to productize the patterns yeah and kind of honing in what your preferred language is almost or dialect mm -hmm. of that language i guess yeah and, but that's never been intentional. You yeah. know? I never meant to create art that looks like this. And actually, my first pieces don't look like this. Um, uh, I can show you afterwards, but first pieces are a little more realistic. Yeah. I'm looking. Interesting. What an interesting thing, too. And I, I think, like, because, like, I'm, I'm, like, not, a, like, ad, I don't have any, like, advanced knowledge in terms of marketing and stuff. But, like, I think about it constantly. But I'm, I'm around so many artists and so many people that, you know, we're just making art and like an intuitive, just whatever, happened, you know, just making art. And then like, I've noticed in a lot of people I know, there's a point they hit where they're like, oh shit, like I gotta learn how to sell shit or I gotta <laughs> learn how to like market or this or that. And I just think it's interesting that, like, I guess to just see, like, because it's almost, like, do you feel like you had a lot of marketing experience? Well, actually, no, that, 
Oh, to finish my question, a lot of marketing experience before you went into the arts, but I feel like we've established mm -hmm. that you kind of see those as kind of interchangeable, the same thing anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty. Yeah. yeah. The only difference between thing. my the only difference between my marketing now versus my marketing in the past is this is the first time I have full control over the product. Well. Oh, oh yeah, in a yeah, way, yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> right, because you've almost been like a like a hired gun, in terms exactly. of marketing. Other something yeah, somebody sell else this, made. You know, right. Gotcha. Sell this as opposed to create. Which, right. You know, in the past, I did create products and, and then go and sold them, but they were always within the context of the platform I was creating mm. the products for. Mm. Um, but now I'm building the platform, and yeah. you know, in, in some ways, I've like created. It's a company, really. That's what it mm. is. It's a startup. It you is. Know, yeah. I have dealers who I um, who I do also like give commission to, and and who I like notify of updates, and they're my sales team. Yeah. You know, I have people who I could call up and be like, hey, let's do a photo shoot, let's do a video shoot, and that's my marketing team. Yeah. You know? Yeah, what an interesting thing. Um, what the fuck? I just had something on my mind. Do you have a question? Oh, this is a little bit off topic, but just talking about, like, um, psychology and authenticity and these different concepts that inform other concepts and today being connected to tomorrow. Like, when you were growing up, were there a lot of creatives around you, or were you in more of, like, like family or friends? Was it more, like, business-oriented or sports even? Like, what was the kind of thing that led you to here? Well, it's, it's wild, um, but uh, I didn't have too, too many friends growing up, and, but there was one main creative who was around me, and it's my dad. Um, he was, he's a small molecule drug discoverer, hmm. um, so basically designs uh, medicines. Wow. So his brain is always like thinking within the context of that world. Yeah. Um, and it's just a very different perspective. Like, like when you know so much about something that you can't see. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like that's wild. And I remember when I first moved into my apartment, I told my roommate, I was like, "Bro, we gotta get a microscope." And he was like, "Why?" And he's like, "Just, just perspective. Just to see that there's other scales." You know. Yeah. Um, and that's because that's like how he viewed the world. Um, huh. And growing up, um, he was supportive of whatever I wanted to do. And at, at the time, I was really interested in medicine. Um, so, you know, this is the weird part about it, but, you know, it's just the way I grew up, and I attribute it to a lot of, like, how I view the world. As, um, but, you know, other kids would be going and playing sports or playing outside and playing video games. I was eight years old doing, like, dissections on, like, frogs and... And like we would just go to like the grocery store and pick up a, a, a heart, and I would oh, just wow. like dissect it and try and understand how it works from the inside out. Yeah. Um, and then just like suturing it back together, um, performing like fake knee surgeries on, on like these dissection animals that like come from like a science uh, website. Um, just because I was really focused on being a general surgeon. Yeah. Um, probably until I was 19. Wow. Um, so I went to like a medical high school and. Um, did, went to medical camps and it really shaped the way um, I view the world not like I don't see things as like like this is a robot this is a guitar like this is a human like I see it as parts yeah you know um, parts that uh, you know they can change yeah it's interesting too because like I don't want to put words into your mouth but it sounds like when we were saying that there's like methodical steps and there's work involved in doing these things I feel like that kind of background almost like when you understand the building blocks that you're working with in life mm -hmm. it it's almost like a kind of faith when you're saying like understanding and knowing so much about things you can't see but mm -hmm. it's also informed by like x like one plus one is two I can get to this point I understand this so I know I can get to here mm -hmm. and it almost seems like that would give you a kind of drive and like greater not capacity, but greater expectation of your own capacity. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that I can get to this point exactly. through method. Exactly, just knowing it's possible. Yeah. And it's very, like, engineering in, in that way. Um, and even if I don't know all the steps, I know, like, one step is to figure out what the next step is. Yeah. You know? Um, and when I get to that step, I'm like, hmm, how do I get to this next step? Well, I should probably learn a little bit of, of Python. Um, and then it will teach me that I actually needed to learn CSS or something. Yeah. You know. That's a really interesting thing. Like, the term I was looking for was self-efficacy. But like when mm -hmm. you're talking about um, 
like when people are saying like it, when you said it's more than cigarettes and berets or like you're born with creativity or you're not mm -hmm. that kind of magical thinking on one hand is like oh I could be an artist I could do anything like this is given to me but it also could be maybe I don't have it like it's not there I'm just fucked I guess mm -hmm. but <laughs> if you just think like if I put in this much labor I will get this outcome or if I really work hard on this I can get to where I need to get to there is no ceiling like yeah. you can just get to what you want to achieve and your dreams are actually a thing you can make a plan to mm -hmm. Which yeah. I think is lost on a lot of creatives with that mythos. Yeah, because in terms of like hard work too, or even like a kind of more scientific way of thinking, like, like you know, my dad was a welder, and mm -hmm. like if that's kind of an example of taking things like Im impossible to manipulate materials, mm -hmm. and through science, knowledge, and technique, manipulating things that are fucking immovable, mm -hmm. yeah. and like melting metal and putting it together, like that's fucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, just, under, just being aware that change is possible. Yeah. Right. You know, that, that like simple thing of just being aware that it's possible is very powerful. Yeah. Because I feel like a lot of people just see the world as it, as it is, you know, this is how things are, this is how things have been, um, which is just not the case, you know, we're talking about time and this building and mm. um, this country and like what we're even doing within our lives and it's always changing, it, it's, change is the only constant. And yeah and you can impact change, like yeah. widespread change. Um, yeah, I think for me, I remember I was watching this Kanye interview and he was like, you know, maybe hundreds of years ago I would have been a playwright. Yeah. But in this moment in time, the, the best way for me to gain as much influence as possible is through rap. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that isn't even his end goal. His end goal is to you know, do other things in fashion and culture and in politics and rap is just a way of him um, accruing information and accruing finances to then go fund that. I feel similarly about my artwork. You yeah. know, this is my way of building a foundation both in um, influence and in capital to then be able to go and build a factory that can create artwork. And, well, it's always going to create artwork, but whether that artwork is a painting on the wall or um, a robot that flies over your shoulder and like helping you with your day-to-day -day <laughs> tasks like I have books full of these invention ideas and I'm just yeah. waiting to be able to fund them you know yeah. yeah that's fucking sick and there's no ceiling that's that's another thing like yeah. in terms of what's possible there's no ceiling you know and that's what part of like my process of putting up the blinders is like I'm not looking to the left and right of what's possible if I was you know I'd probably be getting ready to go to a bar for happy hour or something. I know there's no happy hour here, but, um, <laughs> you know, like uh, what other 24 year olds are doing, like it's not working all day. Yeah. You know, it's, but I compare myself, or I don't compare myself to, but I look at people like Mark Zuckerberg, like Da Vinci, um, like Picasso and being like, all right, what were they? Humans. Yeah. What am I? Human. Yeah. <laughs> I'm alive. It's go time. Let's fucking go. Yeah. You know? And one thing probably all of those people had in common from Kanye to Mark Zuckerberg to Da Vinci, something that I've, I realized that was a flaw that I had in my thinking and creativity, where I realized that I used to always look for precedent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where I would have this fear or hesitation because, and I would try to find somebody that had done something similarly to my idea to give me permission. Mm -hmm. And obviously that didn't work out well for me <laughs> it was just like a, it was a handicap you know and it kind of slowed me down a lot but like that was something that I had to overcome where I had to eventually just be like I need to I need to stop looking for confirmation yeah. you know what I mean like somebody to be like do it jump mm -hmm. like yeah. I need I need to yell that to myself it's you know what though. I mean it's hard it's hard to like you know to because I always think that there's that voice in the back of your head that's saying like do it to, yeah. you know, yeah. follow what you're passionate about. Right. Um, but then to, like, be aware of it, like, consciously, and then to, like, act on it, it's, it's tough, you know? Yeah. And it's hard, too, when you're talking about the reactions of other people or something. Like, something that I like to try and remember, which I don't always, but is important to remember, is that everyone thought the entire time that he was alive that Andy Warhol was fucking insane. He probably was, but yeah, he was also yeah. Andy fucking Warhol. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. and if he wasn't, and if he tried to be 
like if he got like a nine to five and like didn't wear wigs all the time and wasn't making art and was doing the reasonable thing for somebody in his age group, he wouldn't be Andy Warhol and you know, nobody would know who he was. It was funny is he he did actually have all that and abandoned it. Yeah. And risked all of it because yeah. he was a commercial artist. He just did commissions mm. and fucking I don't know maybe he did like magazine advertisements or something. Yeah. I have no idea. But I, I think it's important right. to risk it all. You know? Yeah. Like I I for me I had a a progression of how open I was about talking about my work. At first, I was anonymous on Instagram. Yeah. Then I slowly started adding some friends that I knew wouldn't judge me. Mm. Um, then eventually I started adding acquaintances and so on and so on. And now I'm at a point where I post about my artwork on LinkedIn. Yeah. So my like, connections who were following Temi, following me when I was at BC. Yeah. Um, and they probably look at me like, what the heck? Like, <laughs> <laughs> this guy is, What happened, man? Yeah, you know, what happened? Like, <laughs> but, you know, it's have to give it your all yeah you have to just get after it and just give it your everything um because if you don't it will show and if you don't 100 percent believe in it the whole thing topples yeah you know if for a second i didn't believe in my work i didn't believe in what i was trying to do as an artist then it would completely invalidate everything yeah you know because it's all made up at the end of the day it's all made up yeah everything (laughs) is you know And talking about it from a sales point of view or like thinking of it like a startup, like if you were to create a business or start a clothing line or open a store or something and you were like, I don't know, don't look at me, but this is what I'm doing, nobody would yeah. support you. Like if you no were wear putting, your clothes. Exactly. Yeah. Like why would you want to put your money towards a product or mm-hmm. support a brand or say that you're supporting a brand if that brand doesn't even really, they're not really committing and they don't mm-hmm. really think that they're going to succeed because that's a poor investment from a financial point of view. It's like I, I had a friend that used to say this about haircuts and fashion and stuff that like let's say you decided to get like a mullet or something or some fucking ridiculous haircut. <laughs> this is like such a dumb example, but like if you were embarrassed that you did that look, everybody would know that you were like like wearing a hat for the first time yeah. or something. Mm-hmm. You're not a hat guy. Mm-hmm. But if you're just completely fucking confident, yeah. it just looks like yeah. it's supposed to be there. Yeah. Exactly. But <laughs> That's the thing with performing too, which is a better example with like probably with, with music definitely, but probably, I don't know, probably with all types of performing that if you don't fully believe in, in your performance and what you're bringing to the audience, people kind of see that or they see that you're kind of like maybe a little embarrassed to be there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they start maybe, maybe even if they do still like you, they stop seeing you as like a real artist and maybe they see you as like a beginner mm-hmm. yeah. or something or a student. I used to have to me all the time when I was a younger artist as people would always say like oh what art school do you go to and I was in art school for a little mm. bit and eventually I got so sick of it I started lying mm. that I just stopped telling people I was in art school gosh yeah. you know I, had what someone, I, mean? <laughs> I had someone in here who I told them I didn't go to art school oh yeah and they, they were like you should go to art school and I like stopped for a second I like looked around and was like are we in the same room right now <laughs> like, you like why? Why? <laughs> why you know huh. yeah so it's you know and I think a great thing about art is you know, you give yourself all, like, you give your whole self to it, you're 100% confident in it, and that convinces people that it's, like, real. Yeah. But, if they don't like it, that's fine. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's art, it's subjective, you know, it's not going to be for everyone. There's going to be people who don't even come into my room yeah. and, and to here when I have my open studio. Um, and that's fine. Where it does hurt, though, sometimes, um, is, like, Oh no! It, where when like people will get it and then no longer want it or something. Yeah. Which has happened to me, and that sucks. Like people giving giving up your work, or no, something. Like, um, like I've done like murals uh, for restaurants here, oh, and then like cover it up, blast over it. Damn. Yeah. Which yeah, is that like, would suck. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 yeah. Something that happened to me recently that you know maybe I should have been kind of. Maybe there was some happiness to it, but like some random consignment shop popped up in the city in this one place and started tagging me on Instagram, being like, yo, come check out Brian Huntress's art that we got. And it was somebody, uh, somebody who was collecting my work, brought all of my work, a, a bunch of work they bought for me to a random consignment shop and was, and was just selling all of my shit. <laughs> And was tagging me and it was and it was like I was like yeah maybe that's actually kind of a, an honor in a way mm-hmm. but I was like 
Oh, it's, it's yeah. a good thing. It's a good thing. And, you know, it's... Um, I remember when the first time something like that happened to me, I also felt right, weird kind of about, about it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I got gypped a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, like, that's the goal. Yeah. You know, is to be on the secondary market. Right? Yeah, true, so actually. There's a piece of currency in, in, exactly. in uh, circulation. Yeah. And another thing, too, that's important to remember is, like, when you're having this kind of dialogue with the viewer or the piece is having dialogue with the viewer, that means they're having their own emotional response to the piece. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that just doesn't serve them anymore. Like, mm-hmm. it might not have that's anything true. to do with you as the creator. Which is a really hard... I'm saying that right now in a hypothetical, but if that happened to me or when it has <laughs> happened to me, it's like, ow, that yeah. sucks. But it is kind of a, like... When you put that piece out into the world, it becomes its own entity. You kind of have to yeah. remove your ego a little bit. Mm. Which easier. is tough, though. Yeah, because, it's like, way easier as an artist, that. like you're mm. the one of the best parts is you have full control over it. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, when it, it when it does enter into the secondary market, you don't have full control over it. I think that's yeah. why it hurts. You know, it's because it's like a little like nudge of the ego. Yeah, um, it's like you've given this to the world now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard I've heard a lot of people say that about different art and stuff that uh once you publish something it doesn't belong to you anymore Mm -hmm. which like which is tough but it definitely is true i feel like people usually refer to that in terms of meaning Mm -hmm. and how it's interpreted and what it means culturally to your community or something Mm -hmm. but i suppose it's also true commercially yeah and economically which sucks (laughs) but what an interesting I don't remember who said this, if this is like an actual quote or something somebody said to me, but I I think about it all the time. Somebody said that um, a piece is made once by the artist and again by the viewer Mm. and again by everyone else who sees it after. Wow. And they're all different pieces. Yeah, I grew up with that. Yeah. It's real because it's, you know, it changes over time the meaning, you know, based on the context. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Like, I think I think about that a lot, uh, like with the Mona Lisa, mm. you know, because I feel like its influence has changed yeah. over time. Like when it was first created, it was probably just like, fuck, it was probably crazy to see someone portrayed in that way, yeah. um, with that like kind of like technical skill. And over time, like, its kind of shape became its own entity, removed from the skill that was used to make it, but like as just like a cultural artifact. Yeah. Um, yeah, things often, yeah, definitely historically too, I, they definitely change meaning and shit. Like even like, you know, you're talking about Picasso and like cubism and stuff. Like I don't think he he was like making cubist work toward the end of his career or probably even not even close to a majority of it. That was probably like a couple months or something. I don't actually know, but. Well, I mean, it was, you know, it was like, yeah, it was just the, that moment in time that people attribute to him and Brock, but, you know, the Italian futurists were doing something that looked a lot like it. Yeah, you know? that's true. <laughs> so, and people don't really talk about that as, as much as they do about Picasso. Right. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know, I have weird feelings about Picasso, because he's, like, you know, one of my biggest aesthetic inspirations, but he also wasn't the best right. um, father and lover. And Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I said this to someone recently, uh, I was, they're like, oh, what do you think about him? Because they called me the street Picasso, which was interesting. <laughs> um, but I told them, I was like, yeah, I mean, I feel like he could have done more. Yeah. <laughs> Not necessarily art-wise. I think he made a lot of art, but I think he could have done more with building community. You know? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, that could be said for a lot of historical artists, I feel like. That's an interesting thing to, to consider, too, because their aesthetic contribution is, is subjective. Like, you mm-hmm. know, whether it's good or bad or revolutionary but that I've never really thought about that in terms of their actual personhood because obviously you want to know if they were like a shit bag or not or something but it's interesting to think of what uh I don't know. well like, we're talking about how much of artwork and art making isn't actually physically art making it's about networking and not even from a marketing standpoint but networking and getting to know other people and sharing mm-hmm. insight and learning from other people and what they think of you and what they're making mm-hmm. if you're an asshole <laughs> like, right. that limits your input yeah and we definitely live in a different world because maybe a lot of the artists of the past it really it really probably was at some points truly about what you're contributing aesthetically that's but now that's definitely not true there are bands to fucking go from existing to fucking not existing overnight because they were assholes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, and having nothing to do with how dope their music was or something. 
Yeah. You know, and that's obviously a totally different conversation to have. But like, yeah, the the quali- not just like the quality of the character, but your contribution to your community and your ecosystem and who you are and your thoughts and what you believe in and how you take care of people truly is like. I heard a quote recently where somebody said, "The way you make other people feel is your reputation." Mm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I think that's kind of interesting because. Mm-hmm. I don't know, but well, that's interesting. Yeah. The tough thing, though, I think. I think part of the reason why historically artists haven't really been that, um, I think it's because like, what is an artist like? Like when we talk about like, visual artist, painter, or whatever. Yeah. There's someone who's a little bit separate from society. Yeah. You know, so it makes sense that they would have a little bit of uh, like tough time fully aligning with society. You know, I I walk down the street like dressed like this in the North End, and I'm, I feel different. Because you know I'm bringing LA and Brooklyn and fashion into Boston, but you know like I think it's fine. Like I'm okay if people right. look at me like, what the fuck is that guy wearing? Like, I'm, I'm fine, you know. Um, and for me, if anything, it's like fun to be yeah. able to redefine. Mm. Like when when sometimes when I post about my work, I'll just like be like this is Boston art, you yeah. know, because it is. It's made, made in Boston, here. sold yeah. here, yeah. <laughs> purchased by people who are here. You know? On the Boston Art Podcast. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's amazing that you guys have done this, you know? And like you said, like, right. who are we to say we're the Boston Right. Art? You did it, though. Yeah. Because no one else was doing that. And you right. guys did it. Yeah. yeah. And that's like, anything is possible. And I don't know if y'all saw, I don't know if you, you guys are even into him, but um, Logan Paul and the Floyd. Oh, Floyd yeah, yeah, happened. yeah. Just like every time he was given the mic that night, he was just like, "This is a testament that anything is possible." I'm just a kid from YouTube, and I'm fighting the best, like the <laughs> highest athlete in the sport. Right. That's like so real, and I, yeah. I respect that tremendously. You know, anything is possible, and for me, it's a simple formula: consistency, hard work, passion, plus time. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that too, especially in a place like Boston. So I feel like this is true to a degree everywhere, but here it's really institutional and collegiate and there's a lot of kind of um, rubbing elbows with the right people and making sure that your work has kind of a reputation behind you or an alumni of some art mm-hmm. school or something. But like when I applied at the Museum of Fine Arts, I've been going there since I was a little kid and I just did it on a whim. I think it, it was literally, I just moved to Boston and I was had a second round interview with Roxy's Grilled Cheese and then I applied at the MFA and the MFA called me back. And I was like, what the fuck? That's awesome. <laughs> and I worked there for like two years. And that really changed my perspective on things. Because um, then it's like, once you've reached that hurdle of like, I don't think I can do this, or I can't get accepted there, and then you do, mm-hmm. it's like, all right, well, what's next? What's after that? Something I couldn't have expected before, you know? And I think another thing, too, to get back to community, is like, if you have these kinds of expectations for yourself, or you're in a kind of microculture that um, encourages that, like the city, it kind of isolates people like it makes you think that you can't talk to the person next to you or that you're not as connected to this artist because they are from they graduated from like RISD or something and that they're better or that you're not going to reach that and that is what stops you from doing the work to get to the place where you could be that or you are that in the first place and you're capping yourself you know yeah I think the ego can get in the way in those moments Um, but it's important to just really try and take a step back and objectively be like there's always something to learn there's always more that I don't know yeah you know was that was that a, a, a journey or a learning process for you coming to that kind of perspective completely mm-hmm. completely it took many years and experiences and I'm still I think it's a lifelong pursuit sure of just like battle with the ego mm-hmm. yeah you know <laughs> trying to destroy it to dissolve it and and work with it because it's always prevalent um you know but it was a lot of experiences that assist with that wow <laughs> this has been a good talk what, what time are we at there 123 fuck yeah that was fast <laughs> mm-hmm. this has definitely been an incredibly inspiring interview and trip especially because I was really happy that we were able to do this in your studio Mm -hmm. because we've we've been mostly doing everything over the phone obviously just you know Mm -hmm. because of the uh the world you know hopefully that's changing though it is yeah 
Yeah, it was fucking crazy coming here for the uh, first Friday. Yeah. Too, and just fun. fucking chilling and walking around, just yeah, among human beings. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. It's it's so nice, and I think uh, it's it's for me. It's definitely a little bit um, overwhelming right now because, like I said, I usually put the blinders up and just run. Yeah. And now just talking to people. Um, like a lot of people about my about my work and they're mm-hmm. asking questions about like oh why'd you do that i don't know yeah you know but um but it, it definitely has just like forced the blinders away and i think that's why like last night was a major slap in my face to be able to like see everything i created and, and just like it's it's just weird having goals and and dreams and ambitions and then just like waking up one day and realizing that like you achieved it yeah but you're not fully satisfied you know, it's like, okay, what's next? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, that's exciting, though. Like, it's it's scary on one hand, but it's like, that. what's the next thing? Yeah, I it it is exciting, and I'm very grateful, um, but I'm definitely struggling to be happy about it because yeah. I'm still, you know, still... It's a challenge being a full-time artist. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Rent is not cheap, <laughs> <laughs> you know. It's a fun challenge. Yeah, yeah, and this seems like a pretty, pretty fast-paced environment. This building here mm-hmm. seems like like there, like there, there must be probably good pressure, but there must be a lot of pressure to like fucking get into it and to like get some shit done. And um, yes and no, but like I, I really try not to be influenced by blinders. outside. Yeah, I, I try not gotcha. to be influenced by outside because like if I'm like okay, the pace of the building is this. I need to be in line with that pace. Then I'm already capping myself at what's really yeah. possible for me. Mm. You know, so you're part of the building. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The pace right. of the building could be this, but my process could be this. Yeah. yeah. And if I do this, then that's bringing everyone, like, yeah. keeping everyone there. But if I do this, then it might raise the whole building. For me, that's right. like yeah. community. You know, it's like trying point. to be a leader and inspire others. And you know, there's artists who, like George Kondo, one of my favorite artists. He has an interview where he said. Yeah, I started painting in Boston, but nothing's happening in Boston, so I quickly went to New York. Like, yeah. I'm not that guy. I'm not the person to, like, go to where the pace is already high such that I can thrive. Like, if I was me right now, but in New York in the 80s, like, of course, of course success is going to happen yeah. because you're surrounded by success. Um, and, like, the pace here is, is lit, and it's fun, and it's, it's so much like there's so much going on in Boston that people don't talk about as much as they could um, and I'm glad that you guys are um, you know but there's still opportunity here yeah. there's still major opportunity for growth and I, I believe that that's always the case but here um, you know it's one big office and yeah. we keep helping each other grow yeah like a corporate campus yeah exactly. <laughs> in the arts fuck man this is fucking sick yeah you guys have any Closing questions or one last? I have no idea. We didn't really plan anything for this, for this <laughs> so that whatsoever. Awesome. We try not to in general, really, just to make it as authentic as possible. Oh, that's um, great. If there's anywhere, any projects coming up that you want to plug real quick or like oh, what yeah, your Instagram sure. is or anything? Totally. Um, so there's something happening on Juneteenth, on June 19th. It's, nice. the call, it's called The Morning Show. Um, I'm doing the mural for that, uh, which will be fun. It's going to be a whole lot of vendors, food, music live performances it's gonna be cool um and let's see what else what else what else is coming up stay tuned for this book release that's yeah. gonna be a lot of fun limited edition um not sure how limited we'll see <laughs> um and yeah just like thank you to y'all thank you to everyone who's been supporting me thus far um you know it, it really does take a village and i'm very grateful to everyone who supported me and, and trusted and believed in my vision yeah awesome fuck yeah dude <laughs> yeah i guess we'll shut this off thank you guys for listening fuck yeah <laughs>